Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Hope in Difficult Times with St. Therese and her family with Father Timothy Gallagher. This series of programs is a special presentation of the retreat conducted by Father Timothy Gallagher, which features the lives of St. Therese of Lisieux, Saints Louis and Zelle Martin, servant of God Leone Martin, and the entire Martin family. We now begin Conference 6. Well, let's begin with uh, prayers we've been doing. Let's take the prayer to um, the intercession of Leonie, our sister Francoise Therese. O eternal Father, creator of heaven and earth and giver of life, graciously hear my humble prayer. Grace you gave your daughter, Sister Francoise Therese. Please grant me according to your will. Grace of intercession through Sister Francoise Therese. I pray that she may soon be numbered among your saints so that she may be glorified by your church here on earth. I ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So welcome and a special welcome to all connected virtually with us. It's been great to know you've been along the way with us. We'll start on page 58 of the handout but um, I was asked to say something about Leonie and uh, the maid, Louise. So we'll start with that before we look at page 58. Because we're talking in different settings and conversations, I said this in one setting and didn't realize I hadn't gone through it in the large group. So this is the issue of the relationship between Leonie and the maid, Louise Marais. What happens is, uh, okay, so you have Zélie's struggles to try to win, um, in vain, to win the heart of this young girl. And she's, she is always puzzled. There's something missing that she can't put a hand on because she has the heart of her other children who just love her to death. And then here is this one girl who is refractory, who uh, avoids her, who will not obey her. And she simply cannot figure this out, what, what's going on. And so we've seen her hoping against hope and wondering what will become of this child in all that we've seen. Now, what happens is we are in the last year of both of these sisters' lives. Sister Marie Docite, she dies on February 24th, of 1877, and that's the same year in which in August, uh, Zeli also will die. And two weeks after her death, everything changes. And the, the, the pivotal point, we'll, we'll read just a, a few selections from the letters. You, if you have them in the handout, you can read the full letters uh, if you wanna go through this. Zeli entrusts Leonie to the prayers of her sister. When she meets her the last time, she asks her to be the intercessor for Leonie. And she is convinced that what happens within two weeks of her death is to be attributed to the intercession and prayers of her sister. The key here is Marie. And um, Marie at various times is the one who sees things. You remember when Melanie Therese uh, was not being fed properly by the wet nurse. It's Marie who notices that something's wrong. And she does, does it here again. She just uh, notices that something is not right in that relationship between Leonie and the maid. And that's not easy to see because uh, Leonie will never leave the maid. And she obeys, she's very docile to the maid. The other girls will go out playing after a meal. Sally will urge her to go out as well, and she'll resist. She won't do it, and she said, I'd rather stay in and help the maid. Um, so nothing appears on, on the surface here. On the contrary, 
But Marie begins to sense that something's not right there. She's back now from, from the visitation, and she's living again with the family, with her studies completed. And so she starts to pay increasing attention to what's going on there and gradually uncovers what's really happening. So let's let her uh, talk about this. At the request of Pauline, who was the prioress then, this is in 1909. So you can see we're one year before the beatification process of Therese, and they're probably gearing up toward that. So she asks Marie to write down her remembrances of their childhood. And at this point, she, uh, Marie writes, later we had a maid, that's Louise, who had the unhappy talent of freezing with just one glance, my three little sisters, Pauline, Leonie, and Helene. I was the only one she didn't catch in her net. I saw that poor little Helene was very sad when she happened to get a spot on her stockings or her apron. She didn't dare to play for fear of having that happen and then being scolded by Louise. But I did it on purpose. This is the diamond. But I did it on purpose to show her I wasn't afraid of her. And when she reproached me, I answered her back immediately. I'm free, I am. Je suis libre, je suis. Uh, I'm free, I am. And uh, she goes on to say, and it was she who was afraid of me. Since I'm, since I'm on the chapter of Louise, I will say that, oh, okay, I missed that. She nicked me, nicknamed me, I'm free, I am. And it was she who was afraid of me. Since I'm on the chapter of Louise, I will say that that poor girl made my two sisters, Leonie and Helene, very unhappy. She did love very much little Helen, who was ravishing and had the sweetness of an angel. But as Louise was lacking in judgment, she didn't see that she was terrorizing that poor child and really hurting her. And then Zelie, what Zelie sees is that these two little girls are always with the maid. And it looks like they just love her. They don't want to leave her. They want to be with her. And so nothing of this appears on the surface. So seeing that the two little ones were always around her and seemed to love her, this poor little mama trusted Louise. Uh, Louis gave two nicknames to Marie, the diamond and uh, l'intrépide, the intrepid one. And you can see that. Um, okay, it's Elie. So let's look at the letters now. So February 24th, her sister has died. And now it's March 12th, so we're just two weeks later. And she writes, she's writing to um, her sister-in-law. I think my sister has obtained a great grace for me. You know that I wasn't able to have any influence over Leonie. She ran away from me, she ran away from me, and so on. But since Saturday, everything has changed. What has changed is that Marie has shared her uh, concern about the relationship with uh, Louise and Leonie with Zaley, which opens her eyes to what's really going on, and she firmly immediately puts a stop to it. She forbids Louise to even say a word to uh, Leonie. She wants her to immediately leave the, the household and only permits her to stay because Louise begs so insistently to be able to stay at least as long as Zaley will need her. And so Zelie accepts that on condition that she be dismissed as soon as, well, her own death occurs. And that's in fact what took place. And in the meantime, it just strictly forbids her to have any contact to say a single word to Leonie. And then th this heart of poor Leonie, which has been so starved to give and receive love. And because this has gone on for some years, the maid has been with them 12 years at this point. Um, uh, for the first time, her heart is free to, to give and receive love, and then everything completely changes. But since Saturday, every, everything has changed. And on the same day, writing to uh, Pauline, since your aunt died, I've begged her to return this poor child's heart to me. And Sunday morning, my prayer was answered. Now I have her heart as completely as possible. She doesn't want to leave me for a moment. She hugs me to the point of suffocating me, does everything I tell her without arguing, and works by my side all day long. And then 10 days later, 
I think this is to her sister-in-law, but we'll find out as we read it. I won't be sorry to see her, that is Louise, go, especially since I discovered what she'd put Leonie through. Now, what did she put her through? It was basically, what the maid did was she saw this situation in which Leonie was utterly uncontrollable and she'd be in the household, which would be completely disrupted. She'd be shouting and crying and um, moving and just completely disrupting. You couldn't have any real family life. And there's a business going on and children to raise and so forth. And nobody seemed to be able to, to change this. Uh, even the older sister at the visitation uh, has to admit that she's not able to do it. So Louise decides that she's going to step in where no one else seems able to handle uh, Leonie. And what she does is she, she does it through fear. Stronger, you'd say terror even. Uh, you obey what I tell you, because if you don't, uh, there'll be two consequences. You'll, you'll get a verbal lashing, but you'll also get a physical beating. And this was going on. So we can speak of Leonie as an abused child, physically and verbally. And Leonie was in terror of her. Uh, so she was doing exactly what Louise told her to do. Now, it did bring calm to the household. And so the maid was convinced that she was rendering a service to the family out of ignorance, poor judgment, maybe a little arrogance mixed in there. Because at heart, she was not a bad, a bad woman. And they, they all recognized that, but she was, what she did was just unforgivable. Well, not unforgivable because Leonie does forgive her uh, later on in life. So she also says, if you know, let's say after a meal, as I mentioned, Zaylee might say, I'll go out and play with the others, but she wouldn't do that because what the maid had told her, okay, you obey what your mother is telling you, but you know you're going to pay for it. Uh, so at this point, she's going beyond, you know, simply calming a situation, but she sees herself as the center and the only one who can manage Leonie in that way, obviously. Okay, especially since I discovered what she'd put Leonie through. That you see, I'll never forget. I would never have believed that one could have done for so long and so coldly the things she did to a poor creature who didn't dare complain for fear of getting it twice as bad as she now admits. And would you believe this girl, Louise, the maid, claims that she was being a great help to me? thinking she was very clever to have been able to control your sister, who, in her opinion, no one else could tame. But brutality never converted anyone. It only makes slaves of people, and that's what happened to this poor child. So this is a week later to her aunt, or to her sister-in-law. Leonie continues to become a good child, but it's a difficult land to cultivate. It definitely needs the dew of heavens. And that's always this. It's not just that, that prudent parenting going on here, but always dependence upon the grace uh, of the Lord. Definitely needs the dew of heaven, which I'm sure won't fail us. And she was right. I'm doing everything possible to cultivate it well, and God will make the flowers and the fruits grow. This little one has a heart of gold. Uh, and that's uh, as... Um, Chris mentioned just before we started, everyone recognizes that. And um, Leonie is all about loving and being loved. That's everything for Leonie. You only have to know how to handle her with a great deal of gentleness and then watch what follows. I'm so gentle with her that they criticize me for it, but I know what I'm doing and don't listen to their criticisms. She was brought to this point by an extreme harshness that I didn't suspect and under the influence of the maid who went about it very badly. Although, and uh, Zaylee, like the others, recognizes she's a nice girl deep down, which doesn't forgive what she did. Again, Leonie did forgive her. I mean, it doesn't condone what, what she did. So at this point, Leon, um Zaylee has six more months to live, and she has been feeling before this happens that uh, if God takes her, uh, it's time for her to go because the other four girls are all doing very well. 
she's made every effort that she could with Leonie and failed. And so maybe it's time for me to go. But now everything, everything changes because this, this girl set free to love and receive love now for the first time, just can't get enough of it, just, just needs her. And she knows that no one can help her like a mother uh, can. And so this is where she now begins to pray for more time to be with her, not to be healed of the, of the cancer and so forth, but just to have enough time to, to help Leonie in the way that she needs. And it's a great, those six months are a great blessing. And as I say, this, yeah, Leonie is 14 at this point, and this is a real turning point in her life. A lot more sorrow will be there along the way. Repeated efforts to enter religious life and repeated failures and struggles along the way. But from this point on, that uncontrollable, um, disruptive uh, child is, will no longer be that way. Things will begin to change now in her life. And I'm going to make sure we have enough time to read at least one of her letters before we finish. And we'll see Leonie. Uh, that letter is written five weeks before her death. We'll see uh, where she has. You know, if you read Leonie's letters, and there are about 340 of them conserved. Uh, if you read them and you watch what happens over the years, especially 41 years in the monastic religious life, you, you, not without struggle, but you see the, the maturation. And when they met in, in uh, 1915, as I mentioned, for the cause of, of Therese's canonization, the other sisters were very impressed to see the growth in their sister. Um, and you, you see this if you read the letters. They're all on the Carmelite website. Okay. And in a letter written in the latter years of his life, her life, Leonie refers to Louise and she says, I forgive Montboro. Now, if you look up that what that word means, all of those are, are I'm, it's a very strong word to use. It's used of one who tortures another and so forth. But she writes that I, I forgive her now. And she has some lovely things to say. She's grateful for the way that Louise, Louise really did very generously and selflessly assist I'd say Lee in the last months of, of her illness leading up to her death. And all of the sisters recognize that and we're grateful for it. Okay, uh, let's go to the, to the letters now. Let's see, why did I put that? There we go. So we're on page 58. And uh, we'll look at at least a, a letter or two of Therese here. So this is Therese. She's been in the Carmel for three years now. And she is writing to her aunt on her feast day because the, the full name, Céline Guerin's full name was Elisa Céline. So St. Elizabeth of Hungary is her feast day. That's November 17th. And she's writing the day before. As all of the sisters do, all, all uh, four of the sisters who are in the Carmel right on the feast day of their um, mother. Well, their mother after Tzeli, so to speak, their aunt. Dear aunt, it is very sweet for your littlest daughter. Now that word daughter there is charged with a lot of weight because of, we've talked about this before, the continual losing of her mother, which uh, goes on from her birth up to her ninth year as mother after mother abandons her. And finally, uh, Celine becomes her mother, and she's still there. It is very sweet. So Therese is 18 at this point. It is very sweet for your littlest daughter to come with her older sisters to wish you a happy feast day. Each year, I see the date of November 19th. I'm not sure that maybe uh, Elizabeth of Hungary's feast day was November 19th at that point. It's the 17th today, but we'll leave that to the historians. So each year I see the date of November 19th return with joy, and it is filled with sweet memories for me. It is also rich with hope for the future, which is an interesting thing that she says here. You are not just my mother in the past, but there's something that will continue here. The more I go on in life, now she's 18 years old, 
But Therese, um, you know that verse in, I think it's the Book of Wisdom, how some live a long life in a short period of time? You have to say that of Therese because it is otherwise, um, I mean, she was humanly extremely gifted and then deeply holy and in love with the Lord. And that's a powerful combination. That's why she's a doctor of the church. So you really have to ignore uh, her biological age. You know, that does not correspond to her spiritual age, really. But it's a remarkable thing. The more I go on in life, the more I appreciate how sweet a mother's feast day is. So just imagine Celine reading this letter. In fact, as soon as we finish this letter, we'll read Celine's response, which she wrote the same day. And she'll say as she begins, I have read and reread your letter. And it just totally moved me. Now notice when you dive into, I mean, into the sea of the ocean of Therese, just things are happening all over the place. Uh, different traits of Therese that are always appearing. Therese always shows throughout her life. Um, yeah, I keep using this word remarkable, but it's the right word. Uh, ability to know, to sense where another heart is and how to respond to it exactly in the way that that heart needs. And she knows now how to write to her aunt, who is her mother, just in the way that's going to speak to the heart of, of this woman. More, I appreciate how sweet a mother's feast day is. Now note that she never had a chance to celebrate her mother's feast day, Saint's Day. She was too young. Her mother was taken away from her. And so what she's going to say is, but I have that joy because I can celebrate your, your feast day. Alas, in my childhood, God seemed to take from me forever a joy I had never experienced. But from the height of heaven, she who could no longer bestow her caresses on me, awakened in a maternal heart, dear to her, the tenderness of a mother for her poor little child. And since then, she was able to feel the sweet joys one experiences in honoring a dear mother. So she never had the opportunity to honor her own mother in that way because she was taken away so soon. But I can do it because of you and all that you've been and are and will be in my life. Now you can imagine what it means for her aunt to read this. Who knows Zeli, who has been part of the story from the beginning. Dear little aunt, now that little is uh, an endearing diminutive. So when you see this little that they use so uh, frequently, I don't know what we'd say in English. You could say John or you could say Johnny, you could say dad or say daddy, that kind of thing. It's not a, a perfect parallel, but it's an endearing diminutive. Uh, it, it conveys affection. Dear little aunt, since she has been on the mountain of Carmel, so Therese has been there for three years. And here's another thing. Zaylee never does this, but Therese does this very often. She writes in the third person about herself. And she, she does this very often uh, in her writing. And she's doing it here. She could have written, Dear Little Aunt, since I have been on the mountain of Carmel, but she doesn't. It's just a, a style that she has. Since she has been on the mountain of Carmel, your little Therese feels, now look at this, feels still more deeply, if that be possible, the affection she has for you, which is to say, don't think that the loving relationship of mother and daughter that was there between us ended three years ago when I left and entered the Carmel. It's not only still here, but it's even deeper. The bond of love that I have for you is even deeper. And she'll explain why. And the more, if we could, the whole world could get a hold of this, it would really change the world. Why is that so? Because the more she learns to love Jesus, the greater too becomes her tenderness for her dear relatives, which is absolutely, yeah, the, the closer we grow in love of Jesus, the more that love will overflow from us to those around us. The little gift, so her, uh, Therese's letter is accompanied with a gift, and what it is, as you explained there, it's a card with uh, a little of Therese's hair, um, which was cut after her reception of the habit and arranged to represent a, a branch of lilies. In fact, uh, when her hair was cut um, to receive the veil, they conserved it. And, and it's still there. You can go on the web and 
You can see photos of it. It's, it's long. It must have come down to her waist and blonde. It's just very beautiful. And what she'll say here is how her father used to love that. So this little gift that our mother, that's the prioress, was happy to have made for your feast will tell you better than I, dear aunt, but I am powerless to tell you. And Therese will always say this. Words can't express everything in my heart. She'll say, you know me so well. You, you know what I'm trying to say. And then she'll often say, only in heaven will we be able to communicate everything. We won't need words then. Uh, my heart is filled with emotion when seeing this poor hair, which undoubtedly has no other value but the delicate workmanship and the gracefulness of its arrangement, but which nevertheless was loved by him whom God took away from us. Her father is in the asylum in Caen uh, at this time. So that, that sorrow is never far from Therese's heart in these years. Dear little aunt, do you understand I am happy when seeing it is to her who is dearest to me in this life after my father. That's a powerful thing to say and for the aunt to receive. You, after my father, you are the one I love the most. Uh, that I'm happy it is seeing to, that it, it is to her who is dearest to me in this life after my father, this hair is offered, which he would have received with so much pleasure. Dear little aunt, this letter hardly resembles, resembles a feast day letter in which one must speak only of joy and happiness. So she's aware this, this is meant to be a, a happy letter celebrating a happy occasion. And now she's bringing into it the sufferings of her father. And the next line is true of anything Therese writes. But I myself cannot speak except with my heart. It alone guides my pen. And I am sure the maternal heart I am addressing will be able to understand me and even guess at what I cannot express. Dear aunt, I am obliged to terminate my letter. Probably the time available the, uh, is finishing or there's the uh, divine office to say. But first, I want to send you all my kisses. And this is something I often do in these letters. And I beg you to tell your little daughters, Jeanne and Marie, it is they whom I entrust with giving them to you for me. I am sure they will be charmed by the mission I confide to them, and they will carry it out perfectly. Now, you know, in the story of a soul, for example, you read how that uh, moment in which Therese discovers her vocation, I want to be a warrior, a priest, a martyr, a missionary, I can't be all of that. And then 1 Corinthians 13, you know, there is a greater way. Uh, the great that love is the greatest of all and then she is filled with joy i have found my vocation in the heart of the church i will be loved so there it, it's described but here you see it in practice now what if you lived with a woman who had that kind of sensitivity and knew how to speak to hearts in that way and that's what she was in the convent for that little small group with whom she lived but when she says, in the heart of the church, I will be loved, this is what she means. Always live every day, every moment like this. That's why the letters are really, uh, really interesting, because in the story of the soul, you see the teaching. There are examples, obviously, in it. But in the letters, you see it lived. Because can you see that this letter, like Celie's, is completely other-centered? Everything, the, the entire focus here is on her aunt. She's not writing out of her own need, but to express love to her aunt. And every single letter of Therese is like that, as are the letters of Zelie, as we've seen. Uh, and I beg you to tell your little, okay, so we've said that. I wonder if they did carry it out. I bet they did. Your little daughter is sending you all her best wishes. And I beg you, dear little aunt, to believe in all the tenderness of her childlike heart, signed Sister Therese of the Child Jesus, and in translation, unworthy Carmelite religious, which was kind of a standard thing that they would uh, say. Okay, now on the same day, her, her aunt is so deeply moved by this letter that her aunt sits down and writes a response. Interesting that uh, she doesn't respond. She's received at least, um, at least three other, let's see at this point, what year are we in? She's received at least three other letters from the other sisters, 
but it's Therese that she's, that she's going to answer immediately. Dear little Therese, I read and reread your nice letter. So she's read it and reread it more than once. And I really do not know how to respond to so much thoughtfulness. I wanted to look that up in the original French. I do not know how to respond à tant de délicatesse de sentiment, which is lovely. Uh, the aunt can, um, who also has a very sensitive heart, I don't know how to respond to so much delicacy of sentiment, you know, literally, um, which is translated as thoughtfulness here. But she captures this. She recognizes how, I don't know, how do you say, how uh, with such sure intuition, Therese knows how to say just what she, what her heart needs to hear or wants to hear. You know, oh, we're never going to finish if I keep talking about things. Let's go, let's, let's go ahead with the letter. All right. Um, and then she says, I was very much moved. Tout ému, she says in French. I was completely moved. When seeing all the affection you are showing me and of which your sisters and yourselves have already given me so much proof, so many proofs. What have I done then that God has surrounded me with such loving hearts? I did nothing but answer the last look of a mother whom I loved, and she says it twice here, underlined, very much, very much. And this was the day before Zeli dies. We've talked about this. I believe I understood that look, which nothing will be able to make me forget. It is engraved within my heart. Since that day, I have tried to replace her whom God had taken away from you, but alas, nothing can replace a mother. However, God has willed to bless my feeble efforts, and today he permits me to receive the affection of these young hearts. He willed that the mother who guided your early childhood be raised to a more sublime glory and enjoy heavenly delights. And now she turns to Louis. When I consider this good father, venerable patriarch, we are pleased to call him, bent under the weight of his trial, dragging his cross painfully. And when I remember him as so kind, so happy among his children, taking his dear little queen by the arm, I say to myself, there must be a beautiful heaven where all this will be rewarded. This good father has given three of his children to God, and there remains nothing in return. All these reflections came to me, dear little Therese, when reading your nice letter and receiving your beautiful hair so artistically and delicately arranged. I am hap very happy to possess this souvenir, which is very precious to me, and you will thank your good mother for me until I can do so myself. I have not written your sisters, dear little Therese. You will be my messenger to them, telling them of all the pleasure their affectionate letters gave me. This is another thing that runs uh, throughout all of this correspondence pleasing the other person, uh, which means showing love to the other person, showing affection, helping the other person, relating to the person in a way that will make the person happy. And above all, they want to please Jesus. That's the phrase they'll use uh, over and over again, but also each other. Uh, I hope that this letter, um, so t telling them for all of all the pleasure their affectionate letters gave me, thanking them for their prayers for me and mine, which I beg them to continue. Remember me to Reverend Mother Marie de Gonzague, the prioress. I am very appreciative of the remembrance of the entire Carmel. Remember me to Mother Genevieve, in a word, little Therese. Remember me to all the sisters, telling them of my gratitude. I kiss you with my whole heart and your two dear sisters as well. You've been viewing Hope in Difficult Times with St. Therese and her family with Father Timothy Gallagher. To hear and or to download audio recordings from this retreat and so much more from Father Gallagher, visit discerninghearts.com or you can find them in the free Discerning Hearts app. You can also view other teachings conducted by Father Gallagher by checking out the various playlists listed below. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will 
First, pray for our mission, which is to offer rock-solid and authentic spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about Discerning Hearts and join us next time for Hope in Difficult Times with St. Therese and her family with Father Timothy Gallagher.